What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Lauren Green from Dancing with Marcus, and we speak about the essence of facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you lean back, enjoy the show, and visit workshops.work to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Hello, Lauren. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to learn more from you and Dancing with Markers and great visual, virtual, and just facilitator and entrepreneur. Thank you so much. And I always like to kick off with a simple, maybe difficult question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Thank you so much for that question. I'm so excited to be on with you. The first time I ever facilitated was in high school. And I don't think I've ever told anyone this story, but I wanted to get an A on a paper. And I knew that if I used the book Into the Wild, I would get an A because I knew my teacher really liked that book. And instead of planning this big presentation, I thought this would be so much easier and would take so much less planning if I just lead a discussion. And my mother, who happened to be a facilitator, taught me about doing a human graph where you might put the numbers one through five around a room and ask people a question and then ask them to go stand next to their number that represents their agreement. And so when I was 17, I led a discussion about the book Into the Wild. And I said, on a scale of one to five, with five being he was completely crazy to one being he was revolutionary, how do you see Chris McCandless's actions to go into the wild? And so, and then I did that. So that was the first time I ever facilitated. So maybe since then, <laughs> I would say I was facilitating. <laughs> how did the teacher react and how did the group react? Because that's so creative. And I guess for a high school setting, revolutionary. The teacher, I think, thought it was great. Mr. Rosinski, now I'm going to have to send him this podcast. <laughs> He probably, uh, I think I'm pretty sure I got an A. I tended to be a little bit of a Hermione Granger character in his class. So you know, hopefully that, that earned me back some, some points for being a slightly less annoying than I typically was. And the discussion was great. And, you know, I think I remember thinking that most of the students who were high school age thought that his actions to go into the wild without any kind of training really were very romantic. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I talked about it with my dad, who's more in the, the classic traditional generation, thought he was bat I don't know if I can say curse words, but thought he was Absolutely. crazy. <laughs> That shit crazy. <laughs> so it was, it was also generational. And, you know, I, just, I don't think I had any idea what I tapped into, but it was very easy. And it was very fun. Wow. What did you learn from this experience? Did it somehow shape your way of facilitation? You know, I, I'm not sure if I've ever really reflected on what that experience in high school what kind of influence that had on me. But looking back on it, I think it was a pivotal moment where I realized how much I like creating space for dialogue and conversation. And especially because it was this uh, human graph modality, it was very movement oriented because people have to get up and stand up so they're more engaged and accessing their creative thinking. And where I am now with my career, and this was more so in person, but online too, coming from a dance background, always trying to think about how do I bring movement and exercise into my facilitation. And Human Graph, doing that exercise is, is an awesome one for that. And it's also visualization. Yes, it is. <laughs> Basically, because you get the a sense of what people are up to or what's happening in their minds and can see it and feel it. How has then this moving into the virtual space due to the C-19 outbreak 
impacted your work and facilitation style? Because obviously now it's more difficult to get people to move behind the camera. Yes, yes. You know, I've really adapted to virtual nicely. I'm pretty proud of myself. And part of that was giving myself lots of practice opportunities. Uh, we can talk about this later, but I started a, a free coffee hour on Friday mornings, East Coast time, and, and uh, facilitators come and we talk about virtual tools. And that safety area has helped me gain a lot more confidence working virtually for me and for others. And, um, but you asked about movement doing virtual and how do I incorporate that? So energizers is a really easy way. One thing that I've done before is to do an exercise that uh, in dance class, it's called flocking, <laughs> like a flock of seagulls. And if we were in a room dancing in a big group, somebody would start a movement and then whenever the group would turn, they would start following whoever was in front. And then that person would start a movement and everybody would mimic it. And then as the group starts to turn, then they follow the next person, whoever is in front. If you can imagine that's called flocking. So you're always changing who you're following. And you can do the same thing virtually as a quick five minute energizer. I'm just going to do a little neck stretch And then I'm going to pass the baton over to Miriam. And now Miriam is going to do a movement and she's going to stretch her neck to the other side. And then, so, and you don't need to talk. It's just whoever is leading does something very simple, a gesture, a small, slow movement, and then says, I'm passing the baton to, and then somebody else on the screen. And you just, it's an easy way to move together. People feel connected and granted, Not everyone feels comfortable moving with their camera on, which is critical to that. So I'd say there's a little bit of a caveat and, you know, keep the movement simple if you suspect discomfort so that people can maybe just move an arm or their neck or their head. And if you get a really nice group, then you can get them to stand up and maybe actually move their torso or even their hips if they feel a little bit more comfortable with that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this exercise. And what I love about it is that it also trains presence and listening. Well, listening in a, <laughs> maybe not in a literal sense, but you really have to pay attention and then pass it on. And it um, reminds me a little bit of a, an exercise that I love to do is the stretching check-in, where I invite everyone to get up and someone start stretching and just checking in and everyone copies them. Exactly. Yeah, that's and, exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And I had such good experience actually with it that everyone is thankful for the invitation to get off their chairs and to move their bodies. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We just need to, to orient differently. Yeah. And I will come back to the, to your, morning coffees um, with the practice sessions, because I think that's so important and also how you related to the confidence building. But I also don't want to miss the chance to ask you about the background of your business name, because now knowing that you used to dance, <laughs> I wonder what the context of the connection is to dancing with Marcus. Thank you so much for that. There's a few levels of definition here. And I actually didn't come up with the name. It came to me through one of my colleagues. And I, it was, I think it was either Trent Wagenight or Brian Tarallo. We were all on a team together with the uh, OG Systems Visioneering team. And everybody on our team, we're all visual practitioners, facilitators, and, and graphic recorders. And everybody had their own sort of persona or avatar or side business. Like Brian is Lizard Brain and Trent is Marker Ninja. Heather Martinez is corporate graffiti art. Dean Myers is Viz World. I didn't have an avatar. I didn't have a side name. And so I think um, one of my team members said, you're like dancing with markers instead of dance or dances with markers instead of dances with wolves. The, the movie dances with wolves. And I liked that idea. I like dances with markers, but I like dancing because it's more active and we're dancing together. 
the markers of it's course integrating. yeah 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 and markers of course because I'm a graphic recorder so I work with markers dancing because I have a 30 year background in in dance I I my undergraduate major was in dance I danced professionally in contemporary and jazz dance companies after college so dance is my first love but now the name itself has expanded so because as a facilitator, we're dancing with our participants, whereas when we coach, we're dancing into possibility or into a future state. So there's always dancing. When we create a virtual meeting, there's choreography that has to happen in that virtual meeting. So there's this whole other, I find myself all the time using performance and dance as a metaphor to express what we do, even tech hosting. A tech host is really a stage manager or a behind the scenes person, and they have a list of where they need to be when, where they need to move a prop or when they need to turn up the lights or when they need to pull the curtain. So all of that metaphor and training from theater and from dance comes into the work. So there you go. (laughs) It's very long winded. It's a lot of fun. Not at all. And I, I love the metaphor. And I love the analogy of dancing because it's also this play with leadership and followership because in the business world, we always speak about leadership, but we totally neglect that it is a skill to be a great follower as well. And leaders without followers cannot exist. And being a good follower in dancing is actually crucial. And this makes the dance kind of nice, smooth and right. Yeah. yeah, I love that you brought that in. I've actually been doing some videos with a, um, one of my dance partners. His name is Tim Bowker. His YouTube channel is marble, like rolling a marble and denim, marble and denim like jeans. And he teaches country West Coast swing on YouTube. And so we'll do the videos together. And I love being a follower I because I love that I don't know what's going to happen next. And so if, if um, Tim might say, oh, we're going to do the same move that we did two weeks ago. I say, I don't remember that because I was following. And everybody's, the last thing I'll say is that everyone's different with their level of comfort with that. Because as a participant, you have to be willing to follow and do what we always say is trusting the process. It's so funny that you bring up swing dance because I also used to swing dance, not the West Coast swing, but the other Lindy Hop swing. And the beauty of that is that as a follower, yes, you follow, but you can also inspire the leader to do a little bit of movement. So you can also contribute on a different level than, for instance, in tango. Right. Yeah, there's so much there. (laughs) And yeah, we could have an entire episode about the analogy of dancing and facilitating. We We definitely, maybe you'll get some comments on this podcast about, I would be curious how others feel about the dance metaphor and how it shows up in their practice. Yes. Wonderful prompt. We'll follow up. (laughs) And for me, dancing also relates to confidence. And this is how I (laughs) jump back to what you said earlier, Mm -hmm. because I think that feeling comfortable in your body is a prerequisite to be a good dancer and feeling comfortable with your plan, with your facilitation style, with the tech you're using is crucial for a facilitator. So what does confidence mean to you as a facilitator? And how do you think can we practice it as you relate it to your morning coffee sessions? Oh, sure. Thank you so much for this question. So I believe that that confidence comes with experience and also through community. And that's what we're trying to do with these these Friday coffee chats. So confidence comes with experience, but until you get that experience, you, you need to figure out what you can do to feel more comfortable. And it's um, many people are feeling very vulnerable right now, especially experienced facilitators who are really good at what they do. Now they have to do it in front of a computer instead of in a room. And there's a level of vulnerability and even fear that we haven't had to face in a long time. And I think owning that is the first step. You're just owning that that I'm uncomfortable and then asking for help. 
So one of the things we talk about a lot in coffee chats is how to staff your meetings. And I always say when it comes to virtual meetings, there really are three roles and there could be more than this, but there's three roles. And I explained this to a client last week. So he said, this is important to tell your clients too, that there's the facilitator, the person who guides the process. There's the tech host, the person who's helping produce the meeting, create a seamless user experience. And then there's the role of the scribe, which could be a visual scribe, somebody who's taking pretty notes on their iPad, capturing it visually. It could even be someone who's just taking notes in a Word document, but somebody who's there to really capture. And so those roles can be shared. You might have a facilitator who's also a tech host. You might have a tech host who's also a scribe, but usually the facilitator needs to just focus on that without any of the other stuff because reading a room virtually is different. There's different cues. So all of a sudden somebody has an issue with Zoom and your whole meeting is derailed. Now for for many, the idea of adding staff to their meetings or adding partners to their meetings is very natural. And for others, if you've been working solo for a long time, then this is a really tough step to go outside of your comfort zone and ask for the help that you need. But it is so critical. And even experienced facilitators will go out and get their tech hosting help because they know they can't do it all. Maybe 10 people, you can do it. But after that, you need more help. (laughs) Absolutely, because it's also unpredictable. You never know what's happening. Yeah. Which is true for any workshop, but online, If something, as you described, um, happens with the tech, then you do need your headspace to continue to host or to hold the space and not get derailed. And it's great because there are people out there who love tech hosting and we've created jobs. It's awesome. Like we're creating, this is a job that didn't exist before and now it does. That's awesome. Go give someone a job (laughs) if they want it. Absolutely. And on the other hand, I think... Yeah, educating the client that this is a job and it's a crucial thing to do is so important because what I observed in the beginning, first, all the workshops got canceled then they moved online. For me personally, I realized that it was a fantastic opportunity to just experiment because nobody knew. So if something would go wrong, then it's okay. It's now or never this moment to just try it. But then I realized that many clients then expected a drop in price because, oh, we're doing this online now, so it must be cheaper. Although it doesn't actually make sense because the preparation holding the space is the same and actually the skill set is even more complex. But then adding a tech host or a scriber then would even add more people. So this would mean that it might become even more expensive. That's right. And you may want a second facilitator. And it's it's tricky because, you know, we're used to, you know, so there's uh, Marvin Weisbord and, and Sandra Jan offered the book Future Search and another book. I just posted a blog about their book, uh, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. Oh, that's a Bible. It's a Bible of facilitation. It's a Bible. Yes, yes, it is. And there's this whole idea of getting the whole system in the room. But virtually, that looks different. <laughs> yes, yes, totally. <laughs> because you can't get a 100-person organization on a phone call for eight hours in the day. It won't work. But you can still get the whole system in the room, but you have to adjust it. Maybe it's three meetings with 30 to 40 people in each one or something like that. Or maybe it's a half-day meeting for a representative sampling of the organization, but not the whole thing. So there's room for creativity here that needs to happen for virtual. Yeah. And there are even opportunities to host that um, that weren't possible in the physical world before, because actually we have less excuses not to join. And then with the breakout rooms, you can play around a lot when you're creative enough. And I would like to come back to something that you said earlier is um, that it's more difficult to read the room when it's online. And this is a question that I hear a lot from facilitators, new facilitators, or even team leaders who suddenly have to host their meetings online. How do you read an online room? So it's it's interesting. Well, the first thing I'll say is camera usage. <laughs> there are facilitators who say, everybody turn your camera on. And I don't do that for a couple of reasons. 
the first thing is you just don't know what's going on in people's home life. You know, give them a break, treat adults like adults, as my colleague Brian Tarallo says all the time. And so I, I usually say, I never require cameras on, but we would love to see you if you feel comfortable and your internet is okay. We'd love to see you. It helps us feel more connected. And if you have your camera off, we know why it's completely fine and just make it safe. Never shame someone for not having their camera on. But when they do have the camera on, you, you can get visual facial clues or, you, you know, you can see when somebody's eyeballs are going to the right and to the left, <laughs> you know, maybe they're not paying attention and that you're not going to say, Miriam, I, you know, you know, are you checking your email? I'm not going to do that. But I might say something like, oh, it looks like it's time for a break. Looks like it's time for to do an energizer. Or you ask a question or you do a poll or you do something where if so I think if I sense that people aren't paying attention, it's my job to re-engage, not theirs. That's my job, my responsibility. So reading the room, it can get actually really simple. First off, you got to have a second monitor. <laughs> You have to be have a big screen, some kind of big screen so you can see. But if you can have the videos up and you can just watch for who's unmuting or not muting and you can, and you, it's very visible. You just watch for who's muting and unmuting. And now I know someone unmuted that they want, they want to say something. Two people talked at the same time. We go back to stacking. Okay. First Miriam and then Patrick. And then we're, we're using that. This is also a great role for a budding facilitator who wants to shadow you <laughs> or even your tech host, you know, just come in and can help me watch the room and make it okay for them to interrupt you because you missed it when Patrick wanted to speak or, or so, such and such. Would you delegate one of the roles, maybe the scriber or someone who points out people if they want to say something to one of the participants? Oh, I love that idea. I've never actually done that. But that's, that would be a great agreement to say right in the beginning. If you notice somebody was trying to speak and we miss them, call that out. That's awesome. Builds team building too. Love it. We're going to use that next time. <laughs> yeah, um, I just got the idea. It came to my mind yesterday. I was in a workshop with Gustavo Razzetti about facilitating on your feet. And we're talking about different personalities who might hijack the meeting or disturb And a strategy we came up with, okay, why don't you include them, make them facilitators or give them a role? So I was like, yeah, maybe if you don't have the budget for a second facilitator, maybe you can just appoint someone from the group. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and even, uh, you know, if you don't have the budget for a tech host, maybe the client has somebody that can help out. You just tell them what you need or even the participants Maybe you ask for a volunteer. Hey, is someone really good with Zoom that doesn't mind having playing a little, a special role, give it a special role. I like to do this when, when I have to cluster post-it notes, who's really good with looking for patterns and meaning and a, and a whole bunch of data. And inevitably an engineer will step up and say, I am. <laughs> and you say, great, I have a job for you. Please cluster. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But you know, always using the group. I love it because it also points out the, the relevance of just stepping back and letting the group do the job. It's yeah, what the book says, right? Don't just do something, stand there. So hard. And it is, I wonder why it is so hard. Is it that we want to prove ourselves or the client that we're doing something because they're paying us or is it giving away control? Because I think once we give the group or participants the opportunity to actually cluster to make sense they will feel empowered they will be more engaged they will enjoy it and i think nobody at the end will say oh this was a quite lazy facilitator right yes well i'll go back to when we when we teach coaching training and we it's all about training coaches to ask a question instead of giving their opinion that is one of the core skills of coaching is to lead with a question and it's so hard because we spend our entire time growing up getting an A for having the answer. Everyone wants to have the answer. And we are trained to, if you raise the hand and you get the answer right, then you get an A or you get a gold star. And so now as facilitators, we also have to untrain that a little bit, be okay with not knowing, ask the perceivably dumb question and be that vulnerable. It's so hard. 
and I'm saying this because I try to reinforce it for myself all the time because it's so hard to just stand there and do nothing and just listen, take notes. But if you do those things and you calm yourself, the right moment for you to step in and to offer something or offer the right question will emerge, but only if you're calm and you just stand there. <laughs> yeah, if you're calm and if you have the confidence. I think it's also what you said reminded me of the difficulty to deal with silence. Silence is so important in a meeting to just sit there and not just shoot out an idea, the next question, the next, or explaining what you mean, but just sitting there and reading the silence. Is the silence confused or is the silence rather avoiding or is the silence just reflecting? And if you're not present, if you're not calm, you don't hear the difference. And virtual meetings are very quiet. They can be very quiet. I've led a couple of sessions these last couple of weeks where This is crazy to say, but there's very little talking for most of these meetings and they're extremely productive. I may have to go get the book. There's a visual practice book. I'll think of the name in a second. John Ward, who is a thought leader in kinesthetic modeling, talks about in his chapter, I'll go get the book in a second because it's, it's a great read. But John Ward, he talks about how words sometimes get in the way and how productive we can be with just using our hands. Or in, in this case, in virtual, just using post for the virtual post-it notes on the wall and getting ideas out and using our minds, our hands and our minds to create. And then the dialogue is only needed when there's disagreement. But if you're, if you're a facilitator, that's really tough because you're eliminating verbal feedback to let you know that it's going well or not going well. So I would say to play with silence and play with giving people eight, 10, 15 minutes just to get their thoughts out on the whiteboard or on the mural or whatever tool you're using. And then to, like you said before, ask, how's it going? You know, do you need a break? How was this? Where is there unclarity? And always leave, uh, Brian uses this term all the time, a one sip pause. Have you heard this? No, I love it. One sip. A one sip pause. When you ask a question, leave a one sip pause. The time it takes for you to take a sip of whatever beverage you have next to you, because that's the time it takes for someone to go to their unmute button. Yeah, just the just be mindful that participants have to unmute, have to reflect, to unmute, maybe to switch windows or whatsoever. Out sometimes I can't go one one million, two one million, <laughs> just to see how far I can go. Can I do five one millions before saying something else? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I love the I love the trick. I try to remember that. Hi, this is Andrew. I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. More than 30,000 facilitators, trainers, and coaches use our workshop planner tool and save time and effort in the design process. So how do they do it? Our drag and drop agenda builder makes it easy to transform your ideas into high quality workshops and the timing of your agenda automatically updates when you make changes. You can collaborate in real time with your colleagues and easily share professional looking printouts with your clients. And if you need inspiration, you can check out our library of more than 500 activities and exercises and simply drag the ones you need right into your workshop agenda. So check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process. And now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. What do you think is the, are the key differences in mindset and skill set between a virtual facilitator and an on-site facilitator if there is one at all if there is one i you know i'm i'm scratching my head a bit because so much of the key skills are the same so my mother her name is lee she wrote one of the very first virtual team trainings for a government group in the early 2000s. So this was something she was really ahead of the game on. 
And I was um, just reading through her curriculum back in April and May and looking through it. And, and it was funny because there are a lot of really old tools in there. I'll try to remember some in a second <laughs> that are just laughable. But when you read the curriculum, we still need all of the exact same training. The only difference is the tool. The only difference is the tool. The skills are the same. So that early virtual facilitation, virtual team training, still highly relevant today, even though it's 20 years old. Yeah. And then maybe I was wondering, maybe it's the multitasking that is even more relevant in the virtual space because you have to juggle so many tools. I recently read a, a post on LinkedIn where someone asked the question, how many tools do you use for one workshop from the preparation until delivery of the minutes or whatsoever? the documentation. Oh, that's a good one. Right? I was surprised to see it and then to think about my own process and how many tools I use. And then using Zoom and then maybe Mule um, as a whiteboard, having the visual prompts, making sure that the tech functions, remembering that someone has to unmute. <laughs> I'm writing them down right now. What are the tools I use? You want to share? Yeah, yeah, I definitely. Uh, so we'll Zoom because we use that. I use a program called Session Lab, and I'm actually a Session Lab. I love Lab. Session Lab. Yep, I'm a Session Lab affiliate. <laughs> so I love it that much. I, I promote it all the time. They're sponsors of this podcast. Excellent. Great. Yeah, there are, Session Lab is an awesome tool. I use it to design agendas. It just takes the guesswork. The biggest perk is it takes the guesswork out of figuring out how to make things work in a certain amount of time. So that's the biggest part. And it's got a whole library of content. You can save your own exercises in there and then pull them into your... And the different colors that you can give different colors to different sorts of exercise or what you're doing. And then you have a visual clue whether you're doing too much of the same in a row. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually, so I know it's a little bit of a tangent, but I often do consulting and help other facilitators or um, meeting planners design their agendas, which I love doing that. And usually I start in session lab and I pull up a blank session lab and say, okay, how do you want to start your meeting? And there we go. And we populate it. So session lab is definitely a tool I use a lot. I use texting. I always do a back channel. So I might have WhatsApp open for so that uh, the tech host, the facilitator, everyone can talk during the meeting. Slides, a Google timer, your mural board or, or your Google Doc, whatever you're using to facilitate. So, I mean, even just right there, that's that's seven, so seven or eight tools. It's incredible how quick that goes, right? I usually use Loom to record short videos of how-to and just put them on the mural board. It makes everything so much easier to send it out beforehand. Loom is awesome. I love Loom. I love being able to just quickly record. I have used that to do team training. I have hired a, a few part-timers over the last few months to help out. And I will, yeah, yeah, I'd use it to, to train to train folks. Say, here's, here's how I do this. Here's how I do that. And then you can create a folder of training videos. It's awesome. Yeah, because the time you would take to explain how to use, how to go through a specific process that takes you maybe two minutes If you try to explain that with screenshots and everything, it will take you an, a day. And otherwise, it's just a two-minute video. I really feel like I've used Loom to send video emails. And I feel like if when email was invented, if Loom was available, we would have so many less problems. What if everybody sent video emails instead of text emails? You know, there's the statistic, you can only read 7% of meaning through text. You need tone and body language the other 93. And, and so when I, when I have to have a crucial conversation, A, it's better to do it live. But let's say I need to send an email and it's, I want to make sure they can hear my tone. I'll record myself talking through the email and send that with it so that they can hear me. <laughs> I use, uh, I use Bonjoro. What's that? How do you say it? Bonjoro? Bonjoro. Awesome. I used it for the festival. So every, every participant who bought a ticket I had it in my CRM system. So um, whenever someone bought a ticket, I got a ping, Bonjour, send a video. I recorded a video wherever I was. Hey, 
Welcome on board. So happy to meet you. Thank you for believing in this festival. Click here to join the Slack. So everyone received a kind of personalized message. And that's, that's magic. Awesome. That is amazing. That is very, very cool. Bonjouro. Okay. I just, and this is the beauty of it. When you have these conversations this morning, I learned how to use Padlet. I'd never used Padlet before, but it was a great alternative to clients don't like Mural and they can't use Google. Mm -hmm. Padlet, you know, they have these tools in your back pocket. I always learn new things. Yeah, that's amazing. But it's on the other hand, it's also, it can be overwhelming that there are so many tools and they're just mushrooming. So how to, and that's something that I realized how important it is to choose even the video conferencing tool, depending on the purpose of the meeting. Because sometimes it might be good not to have a video and to be in an avatar disguise like on Teo. And sometimes it's just good to have the good old Zoom because you know what you get. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's really wise. And Ray Ringel, she's a facilitator here in Washington, D.C. She talks about learning a new tool and the importance of only choosing one tool at a time and play with it for two weeks before you grab the next one to prevent that overwhelm. So I, I do is I, I do a lot of bullet journaling and I have a collection in my bullet journal of tools that I hear about. And I get overwhelmed very easily. I have anxiety and stress um, all the time. So it's to write things down and put them away for when I'm ready is part of how I manage that. That's a really good one. Yeah. yeah. And I like the idea of just giving each tool some time to practice and then they're not running away. They will be there if you get they back will to be them. There. <laughs> Chances are by the time you want to get to it, there's a not relevant anyway. So it's a good thing you didn't waste your time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> When we talked about the mindset and skill set, so do you think that confidence, I would like to come back to confidence because I think confidence and courage are two of the key skills for facilitators. Do you think it's more important if you are virtual? Because you also mentioned that it's so vulnerable to be on a video call. And I wonder, is it more vulnerable than being in the in the room together? And would it then mean that we need more confidence when we host or facilitate sessions online? Anything new is going to make you feel more vulnerable and like you don't know what you're doing. And um, you know, I think and women are also prone to the what's called the, the imposter syndrome. Like, who, who am I to do this? Who am I to do virtual and, and show up confidently on virtual? Whatever your inner dialogue is, I have this, I know you can't see this because this is going to be in a podcast, but I've got this little, call him my inner critic doll. It's uh, for those of you who are listening and you can't see, I'm holding up a doll. It's the panic from Hercules. <laughs> and I like keeping him around because whenever I hear myself or if I hear someone else expressing a, like a limiting belief like that, or I can't do it, or this is new. I look at him and I remember that's a limiting belief and it's time to do some reframing. I love it. I love it. I will put it on the list of what to remember when they come around. The, in a recent podcast episode with Melissa Dinwiddie, she mentioned we we're talking about a similar issue of comparing ourselves and having these limiting beliefs. And she called them gremlins. So she has a name for each of these limiting beliefs for each of these gremlins. And when they come around... She acknowledged them and then sent them to pedicure. Do you really? It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And I love the idea to just communicate. Hugo, you know what? Why don't you go and have a pedicure? <laughs> <laughs> Treat yourself. <laughs> Bill is on me. And I think that's really wise because what you're doing with your inner critic is you're you're not ignoring it. You're because what we resist persists. We can't ignore the things that drive us crazy, but we can say, okay, I know that you're a thing, but I'm going to put you over here for the time being. I'm going to reach way down and I'm going to remember that I can do this. And I'm going to pull out a previous time or experience where this went well. And I'm going to draw on that for strength. I'm going to imagine somebody who I admire and put myself in their shoes. I'm going to, and I actually do this, 
put on my Wonder Woman underwear for this <laughs> meeting. I have two sets. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> because whatever is your thing, <laughs> you do whatever you need to do. I do have Wonder Woman underwear. <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> And it does something to our mind. I mean, there's evidence. Right. <laughs> That's what you should title this podcast. <laughs> If you made it this far, you got a really juicy nugget. <laughs> I remember that one. I love it that you point that out and that you're so open about your limiting beliefs and how you... <laughs> how you uh, deal with them. Because for me, we have to show this confidence constantly when we're dealing with groups. We have to lead with courage. We are doing things that maybe we overthink. Oh, fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. And still, I think confidence does not mean that we don't have the inner critic. And me maybe the inner critic actually adds to our confidence that as soon as we have the self-awareness, There's, there's a quote that I can't remember, but it's something about how bravery and fear, they go together. Oh, it was in the new Netflix series on Selena. I think this comes up as a concept in there, that bravery and fear are not separate things. They actually go together. You have to have the fear in order to get the courage. You need to overcome the fear. Yeah, it's and, funny, and, yeah. Totally resonates. Um, I once had a client who gave me this reflection, which really hit me hard, but it resonated so much. He, We talked about judgment of people who are less courageous. Mm -hmm. And he felt judged by me because he was apparently less courageous. So he's always very careful. He sees risks everywhere. And he felt judged by me. He told me, Miriam, don't forget that yeah, bravery is born out of fear. Yeah. And I'm like, ooh, that's why I'm judging because I might be afraid of my own fear. Or even, yeah, and, and it, it could be that, that you weren't judging, but he was perceiving that, which is the amazing thing about feedback. <laughs> Sometimes it says more about the, the giver than, than the receiver. I've got, a, I've got a few blogs I'm going to send you if you want to post them with this. And one of them is on, is on feedback and I talk about that. I totally agree. And I, what I usually or what I often do in workshops is when someone reflects or gives advice or ideas to someone else, I always ask them to use the same color of sticky notes and then go back to the advice they gave to others. Because in 90% of the cases, it applies more to their own case and their own challenge than to the challenge of the other one. That's very wise. And we project, we project all the time. That's how our brain works because that's how we bond with each other. I hear your story. I try to bond with you and to empathize. So the only thing that I can do is I go in my own memory to find something that I can relate to it. I'm taking a, right now a, a class with Jill Greenbaum. She's teaching a class on appreciative living. It's appreciative living learning circle. And I was talking about how I was really struggling with one client to find anything good about the situation. <laughs> and so she challenged me and she said to try to find one thing that you have in common with this person. And I did, I found two things that I had in common with this person. And as soon as I did that, I realized, oh, If I speak to this person and use language that acknowledges these things that I know are true for both of us, maybe I can connect with them better. So so powerful. And it, and it ended up being right at the end of our engagement. So I, I, I used them to write a, a, a closing email. But the two things were we both strive for excellence. And we both appreciate the power of visuals. And I needed, I needed those two things. But that reframing, it's so common to put the blame on the other. I'm a victim, they are the villain. And it's just it's so easy to do that. But reframing, pulling on something you have in common, even a small thing you appreciate, even if it's something that even if it's learning, well, I'm never going to do that again, <laughs> then there was value and you can walk away from that and be okay with it. And that's true for virtual. If you can walk away from that meeting and go, wow, really bombed that one. But Well, good. Here are the 10 things I learned from that experience. Awesome. And have dress rehearsals. 
here's one. I talk about this sometimes. Have my high school theater teacher, Mr. Smith, and he knows I talk about this. He did this really fun thing. Every single show, we had a disaster rehearsal. He called it the disaster rehearsal. And we had to do an entire run of the show. And he would purposefully try to do things to mess us up. Switch the lighting, move a prop, whatever it was. And the idea was the show must go on. Maybe that's what you should call this blog. The show must go on. Or this, or this podcast, rather. And so this ended up getting hilarious to the point where the students, because we're all in high school and we like to joke around, we would submit our own disasters to have happen on stage. And the funniest one, I think, was doing Romeo and Juliet and Mercutio's disaster was instead of instead of dying like he's supposed to, he decided he was going to roll around the, the stage and yell out snakes. <laughs> While we, were, while, we were, while we were all trying to mourn his death. Anyway, have a disaster rehearsal and mess up as much as you can. And you know what? Why don't you... Okay, unsolicited idea generation and random idea generation. What if you use that for your virtual get-togethers? For the coffee chats or for... Or yeah, for, for the coffee chats where you do a practice together, right? In a safe space. And then you yeah. can practice a certain exactly. exercise. Maybe that is something that we all do all the time and then just plug in some disasters. I think this would be so, so valuable actually to practice and to and reflect to about, yeah, reflect on it afterwards. How, how else could you react? What else could you do? Yeah. That's, that's an awesome idea. We've actually had that as we do sometimes use the coffee chats as a practice space. I try to keep it pretty open space. You know, whoever comes, that's what we talk about. Not the people, but whatever they want to talk about. And I love that idea because we've been thinking about maybe having some kind of sign up if you want to play with something that you're going to do in an upcoming meeting. But instead of let's see how you can do it right. Let's prepare you for all the things that could go wrong. <laughs> Just mess it all up. <laughs> and we get so much more creative to do a pre-mortem to think of what can go wrong and then to backward engineer how can you prepare and set yourself up to avoid that our brains get so creative in this exercise yeah and it's scenario it's scenario planning so yeah you know, so there's a mindset of well i don't I, there's two things that could you might resist this one could be well i don't want to do that because then i'm i'm pulling in things that could go wrong. So I don't want to prepare for that. Or I don't want to over prepare my agendas. That's the other thing. I, I don't want to, I don't want to over engineer. I want to be able to be dynamic and be in the moments. So I don't want to do too much planning. And, um, and I disagree with both of those statements because what we're talking about here is scenario planning, but this is actually possibility planning. And in doing so, you're prepared for every, everything. You can go in there, scouts honor, I'm prepared with confidence, because you know, if that Zoom goes off, everybody's going to the conference line. You know, if your internet cuts out, whatever it is, you've got a, a plan for that. I love the possibility planning, because I think that it also gives space to create new exercise that maybe we wouldn't even have thought about otherwise. So maybe if you exercise or you go through the exercise that the cameras go off, how does an exercise feel with cameras off. So what is the difference whether you have a visual clue or not? And then maybe you will start doing things in a different way, just because otherwise you would have never had the opportunity to test it and to try it out. It's very good. It's also really important if somebody does have a visual impairment or a hearing impairment or some other kind of disability that you know how to accommodate that person. And And an internet bandwidth issue is an accommodation that needs to be thought of. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And talking about all these things that can go wrong, for you, what makes a workshop fail? What makes it fail? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, my biggest fear is getting yelled at by an entire room of participants and then the crying and leaving the room. <laughs> But... I actually have been yelled at by a room of participants and I didn't cry and I lived, didn't leave the room. So, so that was, so that gave me, that experience gave me, gave me confidence that I, that I wouldn't, wouldn't let that happen. That would be, that would be my ultimate failure is if I, if I got so distressed to the point that I could no longer hold space. Mm. And 
I've been fortunate enough to, to work with a lot of partners. And so in the darkest moments of a meeting or when things come up that I'm not sure how to handle, most of the time I've, I've got someone else there. And worst case scenario, we take a break. So what's a fail? Here's a fail story for you. I used to, I was, I worked for a, a major government contractor several years ago, and I helped put together manager webinars, monthly manager webinars. And I was working from home on, during one of these webinars, and I did something with the setting. All of the speakers were in the office. I was at home. I played with a setting that muted everybody, including the speakers, and there were 500 managers on the line. That was a fail because we couldn't figure out what the issue was and we had to cancel the whole meeting and i was mortified i was so distraught over that that i that i had done something that this happened but you know what it, it, good for me <laughs> because 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 that happened good for me because that happened and i and i'm so in the moment it was horrible and traumatizing and i couldn't be more grateful because now that fear is behind me. Awesome. That's a growth mindset. That was several years ago. So it's a lot easier to say now. <laughs> always, always. I mean, in the moment you, you don't stand there and say, thank you that this happened. No, no you're like, ah, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Time is running. And before wrapping it up, I am so curious to hear your answer. If you wear hashtag, what would you be? You know, I wrote down the word connection. And so if I was a hashtag, it would be connection, you know, connection between people, you know, even in this podcast, I don't know how many other people I talked about. I get ideas from everywhere. I like connecting people and ideas together. Even if I, I'm not the service that the client is looking for, I'm a connection point to somebody who can be that service for them. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it. I like being that connection point in the hub of a very abundant community. Beautiful. That's very inspiring. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing. I'm so glad I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it's a good one. It's a good question. What's yours? Um, workshops work. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah. It started as a podcast. It was um, one of my early guests who actually came up with the title. And um, yeah, workshops can work. We make workshops work. And I think, yeah, we can change the world one workshop at a time. Yes. And look at us on this global level, making workshops work and connecting people. Yeah. Beautiful thing. Yeah. And I think, yeah, workshop, in workshops that work, they connect people and connect people to ideas and thereby have impact on things that are larger than us. Yeah. And an idea, an idea can outlive us. It's how we, how we live on, not to get too ex existential, but, but ideas have a longer life than, than people do. So it's, that's a beautiful thing. Totally. Yeah. If someone fell asleep after minute one, just woke up and thinks this sounds like a philosophical debate, <laughs> time to listen to the entire show again. What mm -hmm. would you like this person to walk away with? Uh, well, I just would love for you all to continue to build your confidence through community, through practice, through staffing up your events, through standing there, through counting one, one million, two, one million, <laughs> and wearing your Wonder Woman underwear. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so, so much for your time, for sharing, for your openness. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I will put um, all the links in the show notes so that those who do feel inspired can connect, can join your, your morning coffees, practice sessions. Excellent. Yep. And the quick link is just dancingwithmarkers.com forward slash events. You can find all of the events there if you want to check them out. And I'm going to send a, a few blogs that we touched on so that you can put those in the show notes if you want to use any of those resources for your, your personal growth or for your workshops. Wonderful. I did that. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, 
Please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day. Thank <laughs> you.